There is so much to talk about when it comes to how architecture is changing. This time, Uli and Eric and I discuss serverless. So join us. Welcome to the Azure Enablement Show, where we'll be discussing the challenges you and our other tech savvy customers have encountered. Together, we'll be talking with experts to find out how they think about these problems, recommended tools and best practices, and tips they've learned from years of experience that you can use. So today on the Azure Enablement Show, we do something we've never done before. We're going to take our script, and we're going to simply rip it up, because we want to talk today about architecture. And architecture is a discussion. So we're back with Uli and Eric, and I want to pick up a conversation we were just having. We were talking a little bit about how architecture is changing as new things sort of uh, knock on our door. And the next thing I'd like to talk about is uh, this really interesting shift, which I have heard called serverless, but I've also heard serverless be many things. I know what I think of when I think of serverless. So let's sort of let's just define serverless, get that out of the way, and then I really like to understand like what does that mean in 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 the realm of architecture. So either you want to give me your best definition of serverless um, and maybe it'll mesh with mine. Yeah, let me start giving you three dimensions of serverless, which I think will help with the confusion that you have in your head, David. Cool. So the first one is a environment where an observable state is shared in event. And you have a piece of code, in this case, a function, so the Lambda architecture as AWS has propagated it. Um, and that is serverless because the event exists without a server being called. It simply is in an environment. And then there is an environment that just picks it up, a piece of code that says, I'm interested in this event. Let me pick it up and do something with it. So that's the functional programming model. Let's start it, the serverless revolution. But it's really just effectively saying, hey, there's a, an event, something happened and I'm reacting to it. Um, the next thing is an operational pattern. When you think about uh, serverless in the functional space, you effectively see, hey, um, I don't know how many machines host this uh, function. Is it one, five, 20? I don't know. I don't care because there's an event and there's a function. So there's an operational pattern that's now being used to generalize the concept of serverless, which is now, for example, if you issue a query to a SQL data warehouse, that is called serverless because you don't know how many instances of that data warehouses are running. You simply say, here's an event, a thing, a query, and I'm passing it over um, to a database and the database will take care of it. And so that's the other half of that uh, serverless. And you will see this more and more in the cloud where effectively um, an operational pattern is hiding all the details from you. You just tell us how far or how high you want the cloud to jump and you have the trigger, which in this case is a query, an event, or something like that. And the last piece of serverless um, is a business model. Because when um, Lambda came to be, it was the first time that it was effectively charged by calling and running the function. Um, it, you didn't get charged by a virtual machine, by hour, minute, or whatever the thing is, or by hosting a database. You were charged by invoking something, and that invocation effectively uh, cost money. So you have these three things coming together, really forming what's called serverless. Okay, yeah, that does, that does help me. So the thing that gets really funky for me, and maybe that gets into the realm of how architecture is changing is, I have a hard time conceiving of, okay, I've got, I'm using serverless, let's say I'm using functions as a service. So I have a whole bunch of functions that are together collaboratively the application, like, is it, you know, these 10 functions are my application and maybe I change the functions themselves separately and then call it a new application. It's like, like, is it the same, is it the same application if I've changed three of the functions in it? You know, like, like, so, so can we, can we talk a little bit about architecture and how to think about this and how to think about uh, this sort of really decomposed um, micro computing, you know, micro level of things that are just like just the code that somebody does something in event, as you said, and code runs. Now, how do I think about that from an architectural perspective? Look, start, let's start first with the definition because your application is the code, the functions and the events. Because oh. without the events, nothing happens, the application is dead in the water. So you have triggers, events, that effectively are key definition part of the application. And the important piece is that you need to think through how does the event happen 
And then who wants to pick it up? What's the next step after you're doing this? So it's a different way of doing workflows. Um, that's why you had initially you had stateless functions that didn't remember anything. They just event function done. But now you have durable functions because now you want to step up on event one happened. I did some things, but now I'm waiting for event two. And then I want to pick up where I left off and work on event two. So that's a different way of doing workflow. So that's why Azure, for example, has durable functions and non-durable functions. So you have stateless programming and stateful programming. And then Logic Apps, for example, as the new implementation, actually sits on top of durable functions to make it very easy to build a very rich workflow applications. So for me, um, it's really the components are the events, the code, and then the state that you're manipulating. And depending on how you do it, um, it's either becoming a stateful uh, functions app or workflow, depending on how you want to call it. But that's really what's happening in functions today. Well, I think that there's, a, in addition, the only thing I want to add to that, Uli, is I think that there are categories of serverless. And I think largely the misconception, uh, or the or it, it's, a, it's an adequate conception that functions are basically the primary or principal actor in a serverless architecture, which could be true, but there are also other elements of serverless compute, ranging from infrastructure like serverless Kubernetes to logic apps, uh, our version of serverless workflows, Uli, you talked about, um, serverless app services and API gateways. So these are all elements in which we're wicking away the, in, the infrastructure because largely we're going to manage that as a cloud provider. And then the application architecture really is how do I consume these things? And it's not only through the um, implementation of code that runs inside of a function boundary, it could be the integration of a function, a stateful function along with a serverless workflow uh, and that become, those two components become an application. Uh, but earlier in your question, David, I think there's something that, I, that, you, that, that there's a more meaning hiding behind that question, which is if I have all of these different serverless um, capabilities, which may accrue to microservice boundaries, um, and those microservices are reused across multiple applications, then our app, what is an application? What does it actually become? Is an application just a collection of microservices with an orchestrator out front? Um, versus um, uh, managing overlapping dependencies of microservices as they participate in different application scopes. It's a little tricky because because microservice is even at a bigger level, and I'm thinking about like about collection a, a collection of functions here. You know, like how do I, how do I conceive of it from an arc? And the thing that's a little tricky, of course, here is is um, what's the difference between a bunch of functions and pass from your from your perspective? Like somebody else is running the code, not my server, not my thing. So to me, the the differential there is is the unit of Comp computation, fine grained, um, of course, that, I, that I'm paying attention to, but then I don't know how to understand that those units of computation in the aggregate in such a way that I can reason about it from an architectural perspective, reason about it from a management perspective. Like that's my que that's my question. Like, uh, how do I know? Like, I'm going to do a new release. Um, what's a new release mean? Yep. But I think it comes back to the three elements that I mentioned, which is you have the triggers. Yep. input and output because a function ultimately processes gets activated a bit on something it does something and then it kind of hands off to the next uh, the next state and you have the staging which is then defined by this events which are really state changes and depending on how you look at it the state could be centrally managed in a database or it could be just um, something that the function passes on and that's ephemeral it doesn't really matter but at the end of the day the triggers, inputs and outputs, and the function, um, the functionality um, is really what you want to manage as an app. And you can say that the inputs output function, that's an application in itself because you can change the entire thing without changing any of the dependencies. That's not quite true if you have uh, stateful functions where you say, actually what I'm doing is the starting point for the next action. But <clears throat> that's certainly something that uh, you can work through with respect to have a definition of the data flow. If it's stateful and building on top of each other, then you have to manage that as an app. If it's not, which I think is ideal, then you can just take the triggers and the function and call that a capability that you can swip in and out and change and modify. 
So I can imagine, so let's, so like we did in our previous conversation about containers in which I said, okay, this, you know, rosy, rosy world, we have, now we have, you know, now we have serverless, everything's fixed. It's not true because it occurs to me that in, for example, your durable functions example, it's a little bit like a database schema. Like if I have something handing something off to something else and I change one part of this, well, reverting is kind of hard. It's really super hard if everything else is now expecting version three and, you know, like I'm now in version four or, you know, panning stuff before. So am I correct that um, uh, we have not broken the law of physics here or the law of architectural physics, whatever you want to call it, and the same problems we had before are here? They're just perhaps in a different form, the same, the same concerns. Let's say it that way. Problems is not the way I really want to say it, state it. I've been around long enough to remember uh, binary compatibility, right? So I, I think this is really just an evolution of that challenge, right? If, if I make a call to a component and that component breaks its contract and it changes the signature and how I call it, um, that is an issue that we have to deal with. And especially now that application components are becoming more autonomous, more reused across different application boundaries. And that's the way I think about apps these ways. It's a box of domains around specific microservices, which may, those components may actually belong to multiple app domains. Um, now the question becomes, well, what if those microservices either um, change the way in which they're called or change a behavior? You know, the call is the same, but the behavior is different and I'm not expecting it. What do I do? And this to me loops back to our discussion about resiliency. Uh, and if something, some subcomponent of my application is not working, how do I make it seem like it is until I can actually implement, diagnose and implement the fix? So let me throw in a contrarian view a little bit, um, because I would say that the functions or Lambda-based architecture has changed fundamentally some things. If you keep it stateless or ephemeral, if the function truly only acts on input, does something with that input and creates an output, but doesn't store anything, doesn't um, put anything in the database or into whatever durable system, that is actually a fundamental change in terms of how we do this. It's not a new thing. Um, we used to have uh, reactive.net in way back when. Um, so there is a lot of uh, knowledge about this kind of stuff, but I would say that the functions-based model, if done stateless, is really, really changing the way things work. And it's very, very flexible and easy to manage. You still have to do management, meaning versioning and those kind of things. Once you get into durable state, and you manage, for example, durable functions, then it gets more complicated and your concerns, David, like, okay, version mismatch and stuff like that continue to be important. But it's if you can get to input-output uh, manipulations, awesome. And so that's, that for you is, the, is one of the fundamental from an architectural perspective changes for a way to think about things. Well, I, I want to... So, so let me, let's, for the lack of whiplash, I want to go into yet another, like, we, so we've talked about so far, we've talked about the context of containers. We've talked about the context of uh, collaboration environments and just now talked about the context of, of serverless. Um, I know of a couple of other contexts um, that are also seem to me like well, well off the beaten path that architects have to think about. Would you be willing to talk about this uh, like in another video? Yep, perfect. Cool. So let's let's do that. Okay. Well, we're deep in the middle of this conversation. I really hope you'll join us on the next episode where we pick up right where we left off. Join us again on the Azure Enablement Show.